believe that Black Lives Matter while uplifting a foreign government whose police come here and train our police how to kill us. It put me to sleep. I, I, I mean, I was exhausted by the time I finished reading all of it. 63 pages to talk about how do we get accountability for police and oversight and corrections. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. It's astounding to me that the American public is infurious with our government for its failures in dealing with COVID-19. Here are the facts from public health expert John Barry on Democracy Now! on July 16th. I think when you compare where we are to Europe, it gives you a real sense of how bad things are here. You know, Italy was a place that seemed totally devastated uh, by coronavirus first. Right now, they have, on average, about 200 new cases a day in the entire country. Uh, yet their population is roughly equivalent to Texas, Florida, Arizona, Georgia combined. And if you add the cases up in all of those states, you're, you're talking about uh, probably close to, you know, well over 30,000. Uh, 35,000 cases compared to fewer than 200. And yet, we, you know, what that demonstrates is that the public health measures that are being advocated unanimously by every person in public health, that's what Italy did. And they got the cases in the entire country down to 200 a day. If we had done that the first time around, if we had brought our baseline down to a level like that, then we wouldn't be having a debate over uh, opening schools. We wouldn't have a debate over playing football. Those things would be automatically going forward with precautions, and the economy would be operating at practically 100 percent by now. It's gross incompetence or a deliberate refusal to face facts because of some spoiled people's ideas about freedom. Freedom? You stop at a red light, don't you? You don't say it's your right to stop and go on a road whenever you want. Freedom refers to things like speech and religion and protest, not to some grown-up kid's idea that he deserves anything he wants. From the river to the sea, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Gaza, Gaza, don't you cry? Gaza, Gaza, don't you cry? That was the scene on the 12th of July at the Capitol building in Hartford, Connecticut. Some 80 people, mostly students from the University of Connecticut, held a march and rally. They were protesting Israeli plans to annex more land. They talked about various injustices. So Baza, how did people organize for Palestine in this crazy year when school ended? Well, we obviously don't get days off because Palestine doesn't get days off of the occupation. So what we have done is we've had countless meetings. We've reached out to different organizations trying to promote this event. We've worked to make sure we gather like correct information. We want to make sure we give a tribute to the lives that have lo been lost in the recent months. And we just want to come and make sure that Connecticut, because that's what we're, like our jurisdiction is in Connecticut, we want to make sure that like the people here get a better understanding of what's going on and so they can also help with the fight. We're also going to talk about different legislation and different things that the community can do to help out as well. Are you a Palestinian yourself? No, I'm not. I'm from Kashmir, which is also occupied, so I relate in that sense. And I just think that you cannot fight for Kashmiri freedom if I don't fight for Palestinian freedom. 
And were there events on Palestine at the start of the year before the pandemic? Yeah, so in the fall semester, we had an event. Um, we also had John Fossil from Tree of Life speak, as well as some student speakers. And we also wanted to incorporate the culture and show how prominent the culture is and how it's not just like culture, it's a way of life and how people are still trying to find positivity and just get through everything. And do you know if you're going to have classes, physical classes in September or August? There are some classes that are in person as of now, but the majority of classes have been put online. And there's an option for students to take all their classes from home because they will not be giving all the students housing in the fall. So we don't really know as of now. And the, the question of the foreign students, that's up in the air too. Yes, yeah, so that's another thing that's been a fight. Um, there's been a petition at UConn in an effort to allow um, in-person classes for those students so that they do not get deported because they are part of our community and they should not have to be rushed out of the country for something they cannot control. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to say welcome first. Thank you all for coming. Um, so, as we're here today to protest Palestine and the planned annexation that was set to begin on July 1st, and just protest the occupation in general and freedom for Palestinian lives. So, I think we should just get started right away. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Hala. I am a senior at UConn and. My name is My name is Basson. I'm also a senior at UConn. My name is Basla. I'm a junior at UConn. My name is My name is Muhammad. I'm also a junior at UConn. My name is Ibsen, and I'm going to be a sophomore at UConn. My name is Dina, and I'm a junior at UConn. My name is Adana and I'm a senior at UConn. Great. That's the whole SGP board. Uh, so this is um, organized by the Students for Justice in Palestine. I'm going to introduce Hadi Ali, who's going to talk about PLM Solidarity. So I want to talk a little bit about why Palestinian liberation is inherently tied to black liberation. So for a lot of people, Right now is a call to action for black lives. We understand that black lives matter. We understand that the police state and the prison state are oppressing black people. But it is impossible to truly support black liberation without supporting Palestinian liberation. In fact, our revolutionaries, Malcolm X, Huey Newton, Angela Davis, they all understood that the same white supremacy that is killing us here is the same white supremacy that is uplifting a colonial state in Palestine. It is the same white supremacy that allows Palestinian children to be imprisoned and tortured, and for Palestinian land to be stolen and occupied. And so if you do not support Palestine, you cannot support black liberation. You cannot believe that black lives matter while uplifting a foreign government whose police come here and train our police how to kill us whose police come here and say, this is how you steal from them. This is how you murder them and convince everybody it's okay. And so the fight for Palestinian liberation and the fight for black lives is intrinsically the same exact fight. If we allow a settler colonial state, if we allow white supremacy to steal Palestine, to try to erase its people and culture, and to try to uplift capitalism over lives, we are accepting the same fate here. And in fact, as Americans, speaking specifically to African Americans, a community that I'm a part of, we have a duty because our tax dollars are funding that genocide. And so while we're here saying defund the police, while we're here saying tear down the prisons, while we're here saying invest back into communities, 
That fight begins with an understanding that we must overturn the systems that uplift these dollars over lives in the first place. If we're going to boycott police officers, if we're going to boycott prisons, if we're going to boycott prison laborers, we have to, at the very least, the very least that we can do to subscribe to BDS. It's the very least that we can do to say that, yes, my tax dollars, I have no control over that. But I will not be a willful funder of occupation. I will not be somebody who is complicit in white supremacy abroad. If you are not here for transnational liberation, you are not here for liberation of any people. Because as soon as you legitimize Israel, as soon as you legitimize murder of people who don't look like you, you're accepting the same fate for you and your communities here. In 2014, when Michael Brown was murdered by Ferguson police officers, it was organizers in Palestine that were sending messages of solidarity back to America, telling us how to deal with tear gas, telling us how to deal with a militarized police state. When the Black Panther Party was organizing, it was organizing in Palestine, and they reached out to and talk to about mutual aid. Palestinians live under the worst imagination of the carceral state possible. And so our people, Black people, understand that our liberation is tied, and therefore our struggles must be tied. It is not historical, it is now. In the weeks that just passed, when George Floyd was murdered, Breonna Taylor was murdered, a man named Ahmed Akhtar was also murdered in Palestine. And it's the same exact narrative of him being violent, of somebody fearing for their lives, of somebody fearing for their occupation, that has allowed them to justify their murder here, the same way they justify our murders here. So the fight for black liberation the fight for Palestinian liberation is transnational. It goes across borders, it goes across ethnicity, it goes across religion. Because if our people are gonna get free, we gotta start talking to each other now. White supremacy is already working together. The same way that America, as a settler colonial project, sends money to them, in the same way they send their police officers here to teach ours how to kill people, we must begin organizing across borders. We must begin investing ourselves in the lives of people who do not look like us. Because without that, none of us will be free. And so when you leave today, I strongly urge you, if you're going to organize for a prison boycott, contact SJP. They have their resource for us. Contact whoever local people you know who are fighting for Palestine and say, how can we do this together? How do we force our institutions to decolonize? How do we push our people towards transnational liberation? Because once we're together, nobody can stop us. So one more time, y'all. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to win. We have a duty to win. We must love each other and protect each other. We must love each other and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Passing through checkpoints just to get from Ramallah in the West Bank to Jerusalem can sometimes take hours when it should only really take 10 minutes. I've seen young Muslim men being turned away by Israeli soldiers from the doors of Al-Aqsa simply because they appear as if they are a threat. Yet Israeli forces storm Al-Aqsa attacking worshippers every now and then simply because they can and no one is stopping them. When I see Israeli settlements build on Palestinian land, I can't help but think about whose home there was there or whose land it was. Or when I walk through the streets of the old city, I see homes that belong to Palestinians that were there well before 1948. I see shops in the old city struggling to make ends meet because there is so little left. I've seen children playing along border walls in hopes that one day they can, have, they can play on the other side. I've seen Arabic writing being removed from street signs in an attempt to ethnically cleanse what is left. I've seen traditional Palestinian and Middle Eastern foods being labeled as Israeli culture. It saddens me that Palestine has not only been ignored, but erased from history to the point where some people do not even know that it is a country. We must keep the stories of Palestinians and the history of Palestine alive. We must join the fight for, with Palestinians because our voices and our actions are our strength and it only gets stronger as we, as we unite. I will not be silenced when I hear cries of Palestinians longing to be free. Do not underestimate the blood of the Palestinian as it comes with immense pride, strength, and resilience. Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish 
said, on this earth, on this earth, there is that which deserves life, and that is exactly what Palestinians are fighting for, fighting for their life in hopes of seeing the country they now flourish again. Thank you. When I went there the second time, I was a junior in high school, and up until then, every single day, I'd come home and I'd ask my parents, "Hi, how's how's Palestine? How's our family? How's all of this?" And every once in a while, they'd say, hey, do you remember your cousin Ahmed? Remember your cousin Aladdin Dean? They're in prison now. There's no reason why they're in prison. The Israelis just decided, time to imprison them. They look like they're scary, and they look like they'll destroy our country. There's no right to, right to peace there. They just get arrested. And it happens over and over and over again. You get numb to it. I don't know how many times my parents told me my cousins have been arrested. I don't know how many times more I'll, be, I'll hear about it. And I'm sure it'll be in the at least hundreds, at least tens. But I'm hopeful. I'm starting to not feel as numb to this sense of oppression and a sense of oppression anymore. I'm starting to see hope finally inside the room and in, in the air of Palestine. So now let me talk to you about the second time I went there. I was about 16, 17. And now you see the terror. You go through the checkpoints, you go through the Israeli border, and you see, wow. These people really don't care about who I am or that I am a human being. They look at you, they laugh at you. IDF soldiers are on the border and they say with a smile, Welcome to Israel. It's so appalled. It hurts me, it makes me feel like an animal to them. And then you go to, your, to the town that you once knew and I only went there within seven years since the last time I went. And you notice nothing changed. All the stores are in the exact same location as if there is no development because they're not allowed to develop. They're restricted into this community by Israel and they're not allowed to develop. They're not allowed to change or advance in this community. They're just stuck inside of this world. As Hala said, when she said that she went to visit the Al-Aqsa and she saw men being thrown out at the border, I was one of those guys. I went there with my family, my brother, my cousins, my mother, my sister, and dad. And they said, no, you can't come in. We asked why. We're American. We have our U.S. passport right here. They say, no, you're Palestinian. You have a Hawaii, you have a Palestinian ID. You're not allowed in this country. You're not allowed in Israel. Get the hell out. Now, leading up to this inside of Ramallah, there's chains, there's doors, and there's cages to try to funnel you away. And we went all through that, straight to the wall, and they still kicked us out because we're animals to them. It just doesn't make sense to me. It you know, it seriously kills me to know that my aunt, I mean, I never even met this woman before I went on this trip. I had no contact with her. I didn't even know she existed. The woman who, the woman who took me in, fed me, took me places, bought me things, she has to live in a world where she can be go walking outside doing nothing and be, be enough just for being Palestinian. Where she has no rights, no voter rights in Palestinian, where any single day, at any single time, a construction team can come out and show up outside her door and say, get out, we're making a settlement out of this place. Lose, lose your home and everything. So, I mean, this stuff happens. If you see it on videos, you think like maybe it's staged or anything? No, this stuff happens. I see it in front of my eyes when I went there. Um, it's all just random acts of aggression just to instill a sense of fear. But the one thing, the one thing that keeps me going though is that we have counters this fear. I never really realized it until my cousin right next to me, she was like standing up to this group of Israeli soldiers preventing me from going, preventing us from going to Al-Aqsa Mosque just to practice our own religion. But the one thing that keeps me going is knowing that Palestinians are, they're strong, they're so strong and they're proud of their lands, their culture and everything. Being Palestinian, it's a, it's a mindset. You know, it's a, it's a metaphor for the struggle, the resistance, the never back down mentality that we carry in our own lives. Now, a non-student, Gufran Alababidi, is president of the Tree of Life Education Fund. I am here today to share a story, a story of a holy land, the land of Canaan, Palestine. As Mahmoud Darwin, a Palestinian poet, says, it was called Palestine, and its name will continue to be called Palestine. At one time, it was a place where Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived together in peace and harmony. I personally visited, visited Palestine at least six times, but in none of those visits, I was able to recognize that peace and harmony that I always heard about. 
I saw the checkpoints and I went through them every time I wanted to pray at the Aqsa Mosque as well as every time I wanted to travel from one city to another. I have seen the struggles in my own eyes and I have witnessed the injustice as well. And I have felt the anger burning inside my heart reminding me of the painful struggle for the human rights of the Palestinian people. As angry as this made me on my journeys, I also I have to mention how inspired I was of the spirit of the people that I met and listened to their stories. Palestinian and Jews who are struggling together for equality and justice for all. I have met Dawood Nasser, a Palestinian farmer in Bethlehem area, who wrote on, this, on a large stone in the front of his farm, we refuse to be enemies. I have met Lama Abid from Gaza, a 14 years old girl who lived under the siege of Gaza. This girl, just like every other child, has a lot of dreams, many dreams, to become a doctor, to become a TV presenter, to own a huge farm that full of cows and become a, a cow girl in order to support the children in her own community. Lama told me many times that despite all the struggles she's going through, she will never will refuse to dream. She will continue to dream no matter what. I also met Sahar Bardi, a young Jewish lady who has served three prison sentences for her refusal to be recruited into the Israeli military service. I love how she continues to wear a t-shirt that says, I refuse to occupy. It was really great to see a new generation of youth sticking up for Palestine, Black Lives Matter, and for human rights. More of their talks in a future program. You could see them all right now in their complete form by going to thestruggle.org and clicking in our YouTube section. We have to cut away because there is a special session of the Connecticut legislature to deal with the demands of the public who are supporting Black Lives Matter. As we record, people are giving public testimony via Zoom and sending in their ideas of testimony on email. The bill is being considered whose authors are the Democratic Party. You can see the bill and the various groups' reactions to it by going to pepeace.org and clicking on the section on police and racism. You can send in your own testimony via email, judtestimony at cga.ct.gov. Here are some comments at a rally of elders on the New Haven Green a few days ago by longtime activist Barbara Fair. I looked at the, um, the bill last night, the 63-page bill about police accountability. It put me to sleep. I, I, was, I mean, I was exhausted by the time I finished reading all of it. 63 pages to talk about how do we get accountability for police and oversight and corrections. And by the way, corrections is mentioned in the bill already, so it's not a leak that when the session opens that we're not just talking about police accountability and oversight, but we're also talking about correctional oversight and accountability. That's not a big leak. <laughs> Language is important. Use of words like may leave the door open for subjective interpretation. Using the words reasonable or reasonably believe are other problematic language. We are leaving these interpretations up to people who thought it was reasonable to break the spine of Freddie Gray or to shoot Breonna Taylor while she slept in her bed or seven-year-old Ayanna Stanley when she slept on the couch. Promoting Enduring Peace sent in its own testimony about the bill. 
One of the things PEP proposed was to ban the use of police dogs for crowd control. Now this alarming news from July 17th, an article in the Washington Post. It describes federal police in unmarked vans in Portland, Oregon, grabbing people off the streets without warrants and jailing them and attempting to question them and then just letting them go. This is Trump's threatened crackdown and Portland is its test case. Listen to this tweet by a U.S. Senator. A peaceful protester in Portland was shot in the head by one of Donald Trump's secret police. Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat of Oregon, wrote in a Thursday tweet that also called out acting DHS Secretary Chad Wolf. Now Trump and Chad Wolf are weaponizing the Department of Homeland Security as their own occupying army to provide violence on the streets of my hometown because they think it plays well in right-wing media. Want to get your senator's voice to add to the outrage voiced by Senator Wyden. Remember, their telephones all have answering machines and you can leave a message 24-7. This picture should be terrifying to you. It may seem to be just a bunch of building materials, but the material is on land near Killingly, where NCE wants to build a new fracked gas power plant, a plant that would send 2 million tons a year of CO2 up into the air. Until very recent, recently, the land was just empty. NCE doesn't have all the permits yet, but it seems to think that Governor Lamont will give them a pass. Our backs are against the wall, folks. This is the biggest climate threat in New England. More pressure needs to be put on Governor Lamont and Deep's Katie Dykes. Now more from the virtual rally against that plant that was held online a couple weeks ago. Thank you so much, Senna. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to echo some of her words to make sure we're all in this call, tweeting at Governor Lamont, text, you know, texting and calling Governor Lamont, getting on, on public uh, forums and calling him out. We know that him and Katie Dykes have the power to stop this power plant. All right, up next we have Kiana Flores, a uh, rising senior at Wilbur Cross High School, leader of the youth wing of the New Haven Climate Movement. Take it away, Kiana. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So again, my name is Kiana Flores and I'm a rising senior at Cooperative Arts and Humanities High School in New Haven. And I'm here to speak on behalf of the New Haven Climate Movement. We are an activist group that seeks to amplify student youth voices while putting pressure on local government to acknowledge and act on the climate crisis. Now, the discussion of climate change and environmental injustice is often correlated to being a quote unquote, white people issue. However, as a proud Latina, I can say that the climate crisis disproportionately affects low-income black and brown communities. When you speak about climate injustice, you have to recognize the direct link it has to racial injustice. Issues such as pollution, shortage of fresh foods, and climate-induced natural disasters hit those marginalized communities first and the hardest. When you accept the fracking of gas, you are accepting how this gross process not only puts the health of local communities at risk, but destroys the land and ecosystems around it. We need CT to ban fracking and stop this proposed killing leaf fracking infrastructure. If CT can take this first step, we can then open the conversation to renewable energy, which is not only healthier for us, but is proven to be more equitable and affordable to our communities. Gas fracking needs to become an energy of the past and CT can become an example to other states and legislators that fracking gas is no longer tolerable in this day and age. Climate crisis mitigation should be at the top of our priority list as it is our very own present and future at risk. Renewable energy needs to be CT's next step. Currently, New Haven Climate Movement has an electrification committee, committee working on making New Haven less dependent on fossil fuels and more focused on electrifying buildings and vehicles. New Haven Climate Movement is also working on creating an educational or ordinance that will have set climate-related requirements to the schools of New Haven 
such as a mandated number of hours to be allocated to teach about the climate crisis throughout subjects. We believe that students should be given the opportunity to be educated on environmental issues and how it affects their everyday lives. Activism and change start in our schools, and it's time we acknowledge and give our students this chance to make a change. When we protest the fracking of gas, it's not just about killing Lee CT. It's about setting a precedent to the state of Connecticut that we will not tolerate the destruction of our land and public's health. We're here to send a message of climate justice to signal the desperate need for strong, urgent action that will transform CT into a greener, more equitable state. That's our program for today. Remember to keep safe, but keep active. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.